All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining and participating today in Episode 4 of the EMEX Summer Webinar Series. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, we have uh, Brian Havasevich, Principal of the uh, Commodities Management Group at Constellation, who is going to be uh, giving this, this webinar today. Uh, Brian is going to be walking you through some updates to the overall um, energy market, some of the fundamentals, and more importantly, what can you do with that information? How can you use that to guide a customer uh, from prospecting to, to closing and, and educate the customer in a way that is, is meaningful and impactful towards your sales? I'd also like to say uh, we, we, we will be recording this webinar and posting it to uh, the the uh, your portal uh, should be available by later this week uh, and as always please pay attention to some more upcoming webinars that we have uh, throughout the rest of this month and into September when we conclude the webinar series uh, we will be available for questions please submit any questions that you have via the chat feature on uh, the the webinar um, the webinar panel and we will get to those at the end so uh, without further ado, let's get started, and I'll, I'll let Brian take the reins here. Well, thank you, and good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Habasevich. I'm with the Commodities Management Group at Constellation, and we're the, for lack of a better term, the market intel function within Constellation. We are customer-facing to customers relative to the things that drive electric power and natural gas markets, and we are also corporate-facing to, to Exelon in that they use some of our intelligence that to drive some of their decision making around generation and other asset things that they're doing. So I really appreciate your time this morning. I'm just going to update you on the current state of 2019, go back memory lane to back to January and, and roll us to the current uh, time frame and talk about the effects of storage and production on gas pricing. I also want to impress upon everyone uh, that as I'm talking about natural gas and focusing on natural gas, I'm really focusing on electric power. And so here's a couple of stats and numbers. Today, natural gas combined cycle electric generation is approaching 40% of total U.S. electric output, 40%. Coal is about 25%. Nuclear is about 20%. Hydro is about 8%, and then wind and solar and biomass, which is essentially burning wood chips, is everything else. So let me put that back into perspective again. Natural gas is 40, approaching 40. Coal is 25, there's 65. Nukes 20, there's 85. Hydro's 8, that's 92, 93, and the rest is everything else. So natural gas is now the single largest input into power generation number one. Additionally, natural gas is the only form of energy that can come on and off very quickly to balance large load on the grid and keep the grid in balance. When it's going to be 108 degrees today, was it going to be 108 degrees today in Houston? It felt like 128 yesterday, I'll tell you. But we had a little, it felt like a blowtorch was on in the street there, I was going to, I was going to say. But nonetheless, as the grid needs more juice, we load the grid with generation to meet the load. We don't run the, the generation and then the load comes on. As new load, as new load is coming on through the day and people are starting up their factories and turning up the AC and turning on the flat screens and going to work and, uh, and the schools are turning on and that kind of thing, more electric power is needed, and as more electric power is needed, it needs to be loaded by a generator. A power plant needs to come on to meet the increasing load through the day. Additionally, as the evening starts to come, people go to home, they shut the lights off at the office and go home, turn uh, the, the, the washing machines off and whatnot. The power generated, uh, the, the, the load demanded is decreasing. The only thing that can come on and come off to balance that out during the day on a hot summer day like it is here in Houston, Texas, is a gas-fired combined cycle power plant. So the gas-fired combined cycle power plant is the marginal kilowatt to the grid on and off. And it's also the largest single input into the grid as well. And for that reason, the price of natural gas is intrinsically tied 
about 80% to 90% correlated, whether you're in ISO New England, ERCOT, PJM, MISO, CERC, Cal ISO, I don't care where you are, the price of electric power is highly, highly correlated to the price of natural gas, almost one to one. But I just explained why that is. And so that's why when we do a market, energy market fundamentals update, that we focus so much on natural gas, because natural gas is the primary input into the electric power market. So with that, then, all of the things I'm going to say about natural gas, whether they be bullish, bearish, or neutral, then you can lay that onto bullish, bearish, or neutral of electric power. And I think it's a very important discussion because I know that there's a lot of new people in the company and others who maybe understand the relationship but not exactly, and I think it's important to explain that. For those of you who know it very well, I apologize, but I think there's a lot of people in the room potentially who don't know it that well, and I felt that it was an important point to make that I'm really focusing on gas, and I know that most of you are focused on electric power, but they are intertwined. And, of course, many of you are brokering gas, too, so we can, we can cover the, the gas market as well. Two, uh, kill two birds with one stone. So, obviously, weather is a major input into the natural gas and power markets. Hot in the summer uh, means a lot of air conditioning load. We now have two coincidental peaks. So, in natural gas, it's also important to understand that the largest single vertical of demand for natural gas is not industrial, it is not commercial, it is not residential consumers, it's electric power generation. That's the large, if you took all of the trillions of cubic feet that are produced in the country, the largest share of those TCFs go to power generation. It's now the single largest consumer of natural gas in the country. And so weather is playing an increasing role both summer and winter uh, in terms of gas demand. In the summertime, we have a lot of gas demand generated by power generation, right? The single largest consuming sector of the four big buckets of demand, again, residential, commercial, industrial, and power gen. Power gen is number one now. And we've doubled the amount of natural gas used to make electricity since 2010 in the United States. So, it's, and it's a growing element of gas demand in the future. So obviously we're, we concern ourselves with the weather. So let me just talk about weather in general for the year. We, we, had, a, we had a pretty cold winter, a normal, that is, cold winter, uh, pretty much on the lines of 30-year average. We had oscillations in that period where it got warmer. We had warm-ups and cool-downs. That's very typical. And uh, at the bottom line is from a heating degree day standpoint that is population densely weighted, and that's how we look at it from our weather team. And that constellation, we have three staff meteorologists who are obviously energy professionals first, and then, well, they're weathermen first. But they're energy professionals as well. And we look at everything from cooling degree days in the summer to heating degree days in the winter weighted to population. So if it's brutally cold in South Dakota and Montana and Wyoming, that could skew the national numbers in terms of how cold it is. But we look at it from a population because, it, it's, frankly, if it's really, really brutally cold in Montana, it's, that doesn't really matter that much because nobody lives there. But if it's brutally cold in the eastern seaboard in the I-95 corridor, that matters a lot more. So from a weather perspective, we had about a 30-year normal winter. We came out of the winter with very low storage inventories on, an, on a 10-year you know, low in storage to start the the injection season. So for those of you who don't know, we, we have a storage injection season for natural gas where we inject inventories into underground storage. Underground storage in natural gas is predominantly kept. I know that there's underground storage in Texas, but the bigger facilities are predominantly in Michigan, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, and Illinois. So really the Great Lakes region, if you will, of the country is where predominantly most of the underground storage for natural gas takes place. To put that in perspective, we produce about 32 trillion cubic feet per year of natural gas, about 32 TCF trillion cubic feet. And we can store about four to four and a half TCF underground. And we came out of the winter uh, last year, or this year, with very low inventories. And so that was a, that was a kind of a bullish factor in the first quarter, as we exited the first quarter, we inject natural gas into underground storage April through October, 
and we pull it out of underground storage November through March. So there's an injection season, April through October, we put it in the ground and we take it out November through March. And so we had very low storage inventories coming out of the, coming into the uh, second quarter of this year. And then we were, uh, uh, from, a, from a demand perspective, we were looking at 2019 in January of this year, and we were anticipating that LNG exports out of this country would double in 2019. That is largely going to be the case. We had three LNG export facilities operational at the beginning of this year. We now have four, and we will have six by the end of the year. Two more will be coming online. And so a number of the bigger factors that we were looking at in terms of weather, uh, I'm going to roll into the, uh, into the picture now of the near-term weather. Six to ten day map. As you can see, we had a we had a uh, we had a very cool and I'll go back. We had a very cool May and a very cool June actually. So we didn't get a real hard kickstart, if you will, to the summer air conditioning season. And that has played a role in bearishness in the marketplace as we entered the summer season because we were we just we just didn't get the demand component of power generation that we were looking for in terms of. May and June being exceptionally cool, and then summer really turned on July 1st. So, but we didn't have a, a, an early kick start to summer, and we had a very hard start to summer, however, July the 1st. We had an exceptionally hot July. It was the fifth hottest July since 1950, and that produced a lot of generation demand, but importantly, in the teeth of one of the hotter Julys, and in the teeth of record power generation demand in, in a month of July, pricing continued to get soft. And that was a signal that we would see some price softness coming into the third quarter. You couldn't get the market to, to get up and rally a little bit in the teeth of very strong, what would be otherwise in a, a bullish fundamental picture. And we saw prices soften and soften and soften through the month of July coming into August. So. I think that's indicative of a couple of things that we'll talk about here in a few minutes when it comes to production and storage predominantly of natural gas. But as you can see, the six to 10 day weather map is eh, you know, above normal through most of the country, normal in the Southeast uh, United States. Again, um, not severely above, above normal. So you see the yellow above is plus three degrees above the, and normal is the 30 year average temperature. So from a meteorological standpoint. So we're not overly bullish looking. If it were red, 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 you know, super red all over the place, that would be a different story. But given where we are uh, on today's date relative to this weather map from the 6 to 10, that's not an overtly bear, uh, bullish, somewhat supportive of, of current pricing action, but certainly not overtly bullish. Here's the 11 to 15 day map. So this is now getting us more or less to the end of August. And you can see the I-95 corridor continues to be above. And uh, the rest of the country in the interior is normal and then above in the west. So again, not overly, uh, somewhat supportive maybe, uh, but certainly not overtly bullish, by, and, uh, but, but not overly bearish either. It looks neutral to supportive at this point. So summer so far, I kind of, I think we would say that uh, we had a cool May, June. We had a very hot July. We're, we're angling toward a more or less normal August. So ooh, kind of normal-ish, I think, is, is kind of what we're, what we're going to say about this summer. A fairly normal summer, cool start, hot in the middle, and then, but the, I think importantly, the big heat's in. July was the big heat. We're not going to get the big heat carrying over. It's going to be hot. It's going to be summer, but the, you're not going to get uh, what we had in July to repeat in August. Sometimes that happens. That's not what you're going to see here. No, some, no expectations on changes uh, going forward. We're looking for a normal, uh, more or less, slightly above normal August and a normal September to slightly above normal September, but nothing, nothing overtly bullish or bearish. Okay, we do have in our shop a first thought on winter and I wouldn't put any stock into this, but I think it's important from a market perspective in that you don't put a lot of stock into a winter price forecast or a winter forecast 
in early the first half of half of August. However, other counterparties in our industry are looking at these things too, and they might start to make different kinds of bets in different kinds of ways financially. And so it's important that, that we understand that this is out there so that we can attenuate ourselves accordingly relative to market direction and market sentiment, if you will. Very early in the game, but we're in a weak El Nino. A weak El Nino, if that persists coming into the end of the third quarter, early fourth quarter, would mean, uh, typically means upper left-hand corner, cold winter. So we'll see. If the, if the weak El Nino goes away, that would mean warmer winter. So uh, right now we're continuing to see that weak El Nino persist. There's a 61% chance that they ran the model on that that's going to be the case. And so we'll see. But it's worth keeping a finger on the pulse of. It's nothing that you would actually go to. But you could, you could, you could talk to customers about this. What would be the harm in saying, we're in a weak El Nino and there's a better than 60% chance that we're going to continue that and it's going to be a brutally cold winter. Do you think if we have a brutally cold winter that prices for energy are going to go up, down, or remain neutral? What do you think? Do you have five minutes for me to talk about that? Do you have five minutes to, for, to talk about the latest weather forecast out there? We don't have to tell them what we think of the weather forecast. We can tell them what the weather forecast is and let them decide. Talk to them about this. Here's a perfect example of something that you could just be talking about in our space and suddenly when you point out you can use this to sell more and sell better and to create uncertainty and that's you know you're not you're not some sort of Svengali you're you're, you're pointing out a, a point of fact that there's a 61 percent chance we're going to have in a weak El Nino that's going to be a very cold winter if we have a very very cold winter is that going to be bullish bearish or neutral of electric power and natural gas prices what do you think Mr. Customer do you have five minutes here here's the map let me let me share this with you on your on your screen you know go through and speak to and talk about this kind of thing. So this is a great little tool right here. So next slide, weather. Economy, well, the economy. Everyone wants to know about the economy, don't they? I certainly do. So I think the biggest things in the economy are obviously the trade war with China, and we're in a trade war with China. I think that's fair to say. So what's it all gonna mean? Well, I think it's gonna mean that it's gonna be a lot longer than anyone wants to think it's gonna be and it's gonna have a lot of twists and turns, and, but it's not gonna get solved in three months or two months or 60 days or 20 days or some sort of short timeline. This is a big deal, it's a big issue, and so the likelihood of this being resolved very quickly, I think is, is pretty, I'd be surprised if it got resolved very quickly. I think the likelihood of that is pretty low. So. That's one of the things that, that's really causing a lot of agita in our market. It's causing a lot of agita in our financial markets. And it's going to have some impacts and having some impacts on energy. Because remember, pursuant to the Shield Revolution, the United States is the emergent hydrocarbon superpower of the world. And hydrocarbon superpowers export. And we are exporting an enormous amount of energy. And let me put that in perspective for you. How much energy are we exporting? Well, number one, we're the largest energy exporter in the world. We're the largest. Now, for those of us who are over 50, like myself in the room, that's an, enorm that's an incredible statement because I grew up in the two energy crises of the 1970s where we had gasoline lines, we had the energy price shock and the uh, oil embargo of 1973, the Yom Kippur War, which caused that. And then we had, in 1978-79, the Iranian Revolution and the second oil price shock. And both of those oil price shocks caused big recessions, big, 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 big recessions. In fact, in, by 1979, we had double-digit unemployment, double-digit interest rates, and uh, what else was double-digit? The misery index was created. Inflation, unemployment, and, uh, oh, interest rates. We had interest rates were 19%. Try buying a house with a 19% interest rate. Inflation was 14%, unemployment was 13%. That was called the misery index. So uh, when you think about those days in the context of today, the United States is now the largest energy exporting country in the world. It's pretty remarkable. And, we did, and the country did this in seven or eight years. So we are, we are exporting almost 8 million barrels a day of refined petroleum 
natural gas liquids, and crude oil. We're now the, world, the third largest crude oil exporter in the world. In 20, up until 2016, we were not allowed by federal law to export crude oil. And in 36 months, we went from no exports of crude oil to the third largest crude oil exporter in the world. We're the largest exporter of propane in the world. 2019, we will export more propane than we use for the first time ever in the history of that industry. We, we, we produce 2.1 million barrels a day of propane. We're going to export 1.1 million barrels a day, and we're going to use 1 million barrels a day here. Cautionary tale for end users. Propane is a great example. So we have a big customer in Oklahoma who buys about a million gallons a year of propane. And about a year ago, he uh, called us up and said, hey, I, I, I listened to you on natural gas and power, but man, I'm getting, I'm getting creamed on propane. And I, as part of my propane purchasing function here, I, go to, I get to go to a propane conference every year for the past couple of years. And what I've come to learn at this propane conference is we were going to produce a lot more propane pursuant to the Shell Revolution. So we were doubling our production, but our demand was going to be flat at a million barrels a day forever. And I thought, wow, we're going to double production. Demand's going to be flat. So I'll be short. And over the last three years, this was coming into January of this year, over the last three years, prices have tripled. So I've been really caught off guard as to why. I said, well, he said, so why? What's, what's affecting the price of propane? I said, well, everything that you didn't know was affecting the price of propane a few years ago. In other words, we're now exporting more propane than we use. And we're exporting it to China and we're exporting it to greater Asia. And so while you're looking at the weather map in New England and the upper Midwest to gauge whether there's going to be a lot of demand for propane, what you really should be looking at is the Chinese weather map and the propylene market, which is the feedstock for plastics in the Asian market. Those are the things that are going to drive the propane price. Similarly, so escalating trade tensions as the world's leading exporter of energy, almost 8 million barrels a day of refined petroleum and NGLs for starters. That's $300 billion of exports, by the way. That's twice as much exported product as all of U.S. agricultural exports. U.S. agricultural exports are about $150 billion. It took us 200 years to do that. It took the Shield Revolution seven years to make $300 billion a year of energy exports. We're the largest exporter of refined petroleum products in the world, and we're the third largest exporter of crude oil in the world. We're the largest exporter of propane in the world. We're the largest exporter of ethane in the world. And now we're, gonna, we're the third largest LNG exporter in the world in 36 months. So <coughs> trade with China and currency and the things that go into this trade war have an impact on our market. So you need to pay attention. Here's, here's one of them. So crude oil. It's important to understand as energy professionals that, that crude oil, even though we don't sell crude oil in our business, we sell electric power and natural gas, crude oil matters to us. Here's why. So the price of crude oil to a producer or to a natural gas producer, a natural gas producer has both crude oil, natural gas liquids, and natural gas in their portfolio. And so crude oil is a much bigger bang for their buck at the drill bit than is natural gas. If crude oil is 75 or $80 a barrel, there's a pretty big appetite for $2 gas by the producer. $2 is less indifferent, more or less somewhat indifferent to low, low potential natural gas prices. But when crude oil is $50, $50 a barrel or $40 a barrel, there's a very low appetite for low liquids and natural gas pricing. So crude oil really matters a lot to the whole natural gas production spectrum in a big way, more than you might understand. So you should keep your finger on the pulse of the crude oil market. If crude oil prices are going down, that's going to put upward pressure, all of the things being equal, on the price of natural gas and therefore electric power. If crude oil prices are going up, that will relieve pressure on the, the OAN. They're inversely, inversely related. And so a strong U.S. dollar, because of the trade war that we're having with China, they're devaluing their currency. Our currency is getting stronger, and our currency is highly related to the price of oil in terms of the price direction that it takes. A strong dollar means weak oil prices. 
a weak dollar means strong oil prices. We have a very, very strong dollar, and that's pushing prices down for crude oil globally because crude oil is denominated in U.S. dollars. So the, the price of U.S. dollar relative to other currencies is inversely related to the price of crude oil. Crude oil is under downward pressure because one of the big things is because of the strength of the U.S. dollar. There's also concern over global economic growth because China's economy is cooling. I've seen several articles in the journal and several comments from people that I respect in the economic community, at the Hoover Institution, at the Manhattan Institute, and at other think tanks, where there seems to be a predominant view that China is basically flat on, econo on GDP growth right now. They're claiming 6.5%, but I think the prevailing wisdom here is they're in a recession. And if China's in a recession, they're the second largest economy in the world now, about $12.5 trillion. Ours is $21 trillion, but they're now the second largest economy in the world. And so there's concerns that this pressure on trade is having a major effect on the global economy, and therefore crude oil consumption going down or being flat or declining even, and that would lead to lower prices of crude oil, obviously. Demand is falling off because China's uh, in a bit of trouble economically. The U.S. dollar is strong. So why does trade matter to us? I just tried to explain it to you. So it does matter. It is, it is, it is something that is material to us. And so U.S. crude oil, all things being equal, are bullish of, uh, bullish of natural gas prices. And natural gas prices are, of course, tied directly to the price of electric power. So let's talk about storage. We talked a little bit about how much gas we store. Remember, we produce about 32 to 33 trillion cubic feet per year of natural gas. We can store, yeah, four and a half trillion cubic feet of that total 32 to 33 trillion cubic feet of production. So about 12 or 13 percent of total production at the current rate can be stored underground for redelivery in the winter. And so storage inventories matter to us. They matter more or less depending on how rich or how not rich they are relative to historic inventory levels. So right now I would say that storage is uh, well on track to hit about 3.8 TCF at the end of October. That's the sort of current EIA, Energy Information Administration, that's the EIA, which is part of the Department of Energy, the DOE. So we're, we've had, uh, we started the season, we started the season, the injection season, that is April 1st, the, when we start to inject gas in underground storage, we started the injection season at a 10-year low. But because production, and I'll show you that in a minute, because production is so good, relative, not good, but so high year over year, production is high year over year, it has made and filled up that storage deficit very quickly. And also the weather didn't help because we had a end of winter in March, but then we didn't have, a, we didn't have any quick start to summer in May and June. And that tamped down what otherwise would have been more demand for electric power generation load. And so those factors combined, high production and Lack of weather cooperation fills storage inventories. We had eight or nine weeks in a row of triple-digit injections, which were all-time records, eight or nine uh, 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 weeks in a row. And so storage went from a bullish indicator in the first quarter. Hey, we're really low. That's bullish. We're really low in storage inventories. That would be bullish. Otherwise, all the, to a bearish indicator by June. Because by June, we were filling up so fast. And you have, a, you have an idea, then you have an algorithm that you work on, basically on storage. You start to calculate the degree days, the air conditioning loads, and the power gen demand, the exports. And you, you are now kicking out a pretty reliable storage injection model once you get into the, well into the second quarter. And so there's a lot of comfort in the marketplace that we're going to have ample storage, 3.8 TCF, a lot more storage than we had last year, uh, and above the five-year average of inventory, and that's giving a lot of bearishness into the marketplace. So storage has been a bearish factor for several months going forward. I'd say it's now in the it's in the it's cooked into the numbers more or less at this point. So unless there's a surprise, 
and we get a lot more injections than we otherwise would have thought that it's kind of baked in at this point. But it has been a bearish factor, without a doubt. So storage is bearish. Weather, neutral to slightly bearish. Again, so then you roll into production. Dry gas production. Well, we, uh, we, we did actually kick up uh, through the month of, I want to update this a little bit, because if you look at the total numbers of production, uh, we're now at about 91.3 to 91.5 BCF, billion cubic feet per day of dry gas production. So you can see on the x-axis, uh, that's time. On the y-axis, that's billions of cubic feet per day. So a couple of things I want to draw to your attention. BCF a day. Look at 2018. It's the black line, upper left-hand corner. And you can see that, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see that the uh, last year in 2018, we started the year in January at about 77-ish BCF a day of production. And by the time we hit August, we were at 85-ish BCF a day. So last year, 2018, we started the year at 77 BCF a day, more or less, of production. And by this time in August, we were hitting 85. This year, however, we started the year at around 88, 89. We're now at 90, 91. More or less flat, at least so far. Now, again, ticking up here in the month of August, picking up almost a BCF a day in the last week, that's pretty remarkable. But the point is that if you look at just last year, year to date, we were up 8 BCF a day. Year to date here, we're up 1 or 2. So the trajectory has changed a lot, number one. Even though the year-over-year -year numbers are impressive, why do we produce, look at, look at the impressive increase 2018, 2019 in natural gas production. Well, first of all, that's all because of the shale revolution. So we have been, with the exception of 2016, when prices got really, really low and, and production then fell off for crude oil and natural gas because of low prices. With the exception of 2016, the, the, per, the time period of the shale revolution starting in 20, uh, 2007, 2008, we have year over year increased our natural gas production, right? But the, the biggest increases have come in 2018 and 2019. And the reason for that is twofold. One, in 2018, a large number of pipeline assets and infrastructure to get stranded gas out of the Marcellus and Utica shales came online. It had been under construction for a period of two or three or four years, depending on which project you're talking about. But it came online and came to fruition in 2018 and brought a lot of what was unmonetized, stranded supply in the Utica and the Marcellus to market, number one. Number two, the price of crude oil recovered and brought a lot of associated natural gas in the Permian to the fore as well. So crude oil price recovery brings associated natural gas, that is natural gas associated with the production of crude oil to market at the same time that a convergence of infrastructure in the form of pipe and processing, particularly in the Marcellus and the Utica, but other places as well, converged on 18 to drive 18 and 19 way above the line. So where are we going from here? Well, if we continue to be more or less flat for the rest of this year, uh, that would begin to favor the demand side of the balance. In other words, we're, we're oversupplied right now. That's obvious when you look at the screen. But if, this, if, we don't, if, if, if production stays flat through the year, there are other demand components that are going to come in here, like another 3 BCF a day of new LNG demand, for instance. And then winter comes into play, right, somewhere. And if you have an early kickstart to winter like you did last year, again, we saw prices go from the second quarter last year in natural gas to the fourth quarter up over 70%. Hey, there's another talking point. Last year, prices for natural gas and other energy forms rose as much as 70% from the second quarter to the fourth quarter. Do you think you want to buy these very low prices now this year? The same thing could happen this year. What would stop? What could stop it? If we have an early kickstart to winter like we did last year, prices went up significantly. If you're not buying now, you probably should be buying some, if not all, of that energy, right? You can use last year as your example. So, Dry gas production has been more or less flat, albeit 
the, the first eight day, the first 13 days of uh, August, we are now ticking up a bit. So we'll see how that goes. Production matters. We we keep track of it every day. Gas consumption in the power sector setting an all-time record. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. We have retired since 2010 about 40 percent of our coal-fired power plants in this country. So we have retired about 225 units. So we were at 525 roughly coal-fired power plants in the United States in 2010. We retired 225. We're down to 300 units. And really one of the only games in town, obviously, to fill that baseload energy is gas-fired combined cycle power. And therefore, you're seeing a you know, record gas consumption in the power sector. LNG facilities uh, set a record in July. That's not a surprise. Again, you can see the, the ramp up in, in uh, BCF a day. And again, that's also help, that will also help mop up some excess supply as we get into the, uh, the fourth quarter of this year. And then you have a lot of new LNG interest in terms of new terminals uh, on, the, on the books. I think there are 13 facilities additionally that are in some sort of permitting process with the FERC at this point. The United States as energy exporter to the world is a kind of a well-oiled machine at this point. Again, we're the emergent hydrocarbon superpower of the world, and hydrocarbon superpowers export. And end users should understand that our market is changing, like the propane market has changed radically. And now, if you take six BCF a day of exports to Mexico, and you were to have up to 10 BCF a day of LNG exports, and now we're a net exporter of natural gas to Canada. That's two BCF a day there. And then you calculate, okay, 10, 6, 2, there's 18, and we're producing 90-ish, right? Well, that's beginning to change our market in a way that outside forces of pricing action are going to influence over the coming years our market in a way they never did before because we were a very isolated gas island unto ourselves. We are no longer such a thing. Again, something to talk to customers about. We're no longer a gas, you know, you can use this information to address or to engage and to get traction with customers about what's going on in our market because it's changing. And everyone's, you know, kind of fat, dumb, and happy with these low prices, which is great, right? But things are changing at a rate that no one could have even contemplated just a few years ago. So one of the things that we talked about uh, to, so, to some of our, our folks internally is that what, what, could, what could drive prices higher uh, coming into 2020? And one of the things that could drive prices higher is the demand for profit in shale. Again, remember I'm talking about natural gas, but I'm really talking about electric power as well. And so when you look at the return on equity for shale, it's been lousy. And if I extended this all the way back to 2008, it would even look lousier. So shale drillers have not made a lot of money. In fact, they've not returned money to the shareholders. If you look at the, the, the share prices in the energy sector in 2019, are a disaster. And so return on equity is lousy. Um, cash flow. Cash flow is terrible. So in the first quarter of 2019, 10% of shale producers had positive cash flow. And so what you're seeing is a call by Wall Street to get some new discipline and show us the money and quit showing us so much production and show us the money. Get some discipline. Cut back on CapEx. The easy money right now is not showing up to the shale community. And you also notice if you watch the headlines that the big guys are moving in to the Permian and they're moving to other places, meaning new discipline, new discipline. And so new discipline could mean what? What do you think it could mean? It could mean that production begins to change a bit. It doesn't mean that it, the, the gas is there, the oil is there. But when you're not making any money getting it, someone's going to complain. And we're 10 years into this thing. We're 10 years in, and no one's making money. So somewhere along the line, that could have begin to exert itself as a force in 2020 and 2021. Here's a great talking point to talk to customers about, right? Investors in, investors in shale are demanding money and returns. They haven't gotten them. 
Do you think that's bullish, bearish, or neutral of pricing action going forward? There's a lot of ways you can use this information to address customers to sell more, sell better. My next prompt month hit a three-year low. So prices haven't been this good for years. You should buy some, right? Prices haven't been this low in years. And adjusted for inflation, adjusted for inflation, energy prices are at a 50 to 100-year low depending on where you are. 50 to a, that's literally true. Adjusted for inflation. I'll use myself as an example. When I graduated from high school in 1980, the price of gasoline was $1.25 a gallon. Well, adjusted for inflation, $1.25 a gallon is $3.90 in today's money, $3.90 a gallon. And here's the other thing. Our car got 12 miles to a gallon. So today's my car gets 36 miles to a gallon. So gasoline was actually $12 to $13 a gallon for us in the late 1970s, early 1980s. What else can you name me that costs a fraction of what it did, a washing machine, a college education, a cup of Starbucks, nothing. We are at very, very low prices for energy in this country. So when you're talking to customers, you can use pricing action and price history as a helpful thing to put things into perspective for them. There's not a lot, of, there's not a lot more downside opportunity. There's a lot of upside price risk. When prices get this low, the downside opportunity is diminishing. The upside price risk is actually rising. You can point that. Just look at the look at the direction of that curve. The down is it going to a dollar? No, it's not going to a dollar. It's not going to happen. Not going. If it does, we're none of us is going to be employed. It's going to be like the the, the biggest recession since 1979, and that was a bad one, right? So, point being that you can use pricing action to talk to. Uh, the low prices are, are actually a, a talking point to address, to engage, and to get people to act. So low prices aren't going to last forever. And when you look at the low prices in the deferred NYMEX, they're at all-time lows. Do you want to if, – if I offered you Apple stock at 1% above its all-time low, would you buy some? Would you get long a little bit? If I offered, if I offered you energy – at 1% off of its all-time low for 20, 21, 22, would you buy some? Would you buy some? 10%, 20%, 10%, 20%, would you buy a little bit? Oh no, you're so smart that you know that it's gonna be lower, right? So you're not gonna buy any. And that, you know the smartest guy in the, the smartest, we talked about this last night, was it Isaac Newton? Was he the smartest guy in the world? He's one of them. One of them. I mean, there's, there's, there's not too many people that can sit in the same room in terms of absolute intelligence. Isaac Newton created differential calculus and integral calculus because the physics that he was working on, the math wasn't powerful enough to accommodate the law of gravity and the law of planetary motion, among other things. As a guy, 23 years old, he's working on the law of gravity and the law of planetary motion, right? But the math at the time wasn't powerful enough to accommodate that. So he created a new branch called calculus. Yeah, I'll sit down and I'll make a, I'm going to create a new mathematical brain, right? Newton was a definitive genius. A lot of people use that term. They talk about their kids. My kids are, yeah, they're not, trust me, your kids aren't, my kids aren't geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> we use the term very loosely. He was a real one. And he's one of a couple of dozen maybe in human history. If you really want to put that rarefied air around a guy like Einstein, Newton, Bach, those are real geniuses. Michelangelo would be is a you look at the Sistine Chapel you know Michelangelo is a genius right okay so Newton invested an enormous amount of money in what was called the South Sea Company and the South Sea Company was a uh, a an agreement between various nobles in England to assume the hundred years war debt in exchange for an exclusive contract to trade everything out of South America that would come through them that would go to England and so the British government snapped that up. And they issued shares in the company, and the shares began to skyrocket. And Newton was one of the early in investors. And the, the guy created the uh, perfected Kepler's law of planetary motion, wrote the law of gravity, wrote all the, the, the Principia Mathematica, uh, calculus, differential calculus, integral calculus, 3D calculus, linear algebra. Um, so the guy's pretty bright, right? And he invests his money in the South Sea Company, and he, the stock goes up over three years, and he gets out. And he has 20,000 pounds sterling. 
which is the equivalent today of $100 million, which there was almost no one in the world who had $100 million. He was one of the richest men in the world. But Newton, being the smartest guy in the room ever, literally watched his dumber friends, right? Guys he knew were dumb compared, I mean, yeah. when you're Isaac Newton, everyone is dumb, okay? Even, even, if, you're, even if you're another physics professor, you're, you're, you're still, you're way down there. So he's watching all of his buddies who stayed in get richer and richer, and he can't take it anymore, and he gets back in. And as soon as he gets back in, the whole thing collapses and he loses all of his money. And he writes, I can foresee the movement of the planet, but I cannot foretell the madness of men. So when you're talking to your customers, you know, you, I don't know if you can tell them the story of Isaac Newton, but you might want to remind them that if they really know where the absolute bottom of the market is, Isaac Newton didn't know. And if he didn't know, they don't know. And that maybe you should buy a little bit of what our all-time lows in the deferred power, same thing, power prices, all-time lows, power prices, all-time lows. Maybe you should buy, buy some of that, okay? So that's my take on the, the market. I think we're going to be in for some continued softness as we get into the, as we continue into the month of September. September, I think, will be a soft month. And then we'll see where we kind of will probably settle and then wait on winter. So October maybe it's still it's gonna be mushy. But the point is that if you know exactly when things are gonna turn and maybe potentially go up, don't do anything, right? Be, you're smarter than Isaac Newton. But nobody knows that. And the point is that the downside opportunity, even though we're probably gonna see some softness in the coming two months, the downside opportunity is limited. And the upside risk is much higher, much greater than the downside opportunity. And when the downside opportunity is one and the upside price risk is four, you manage to the upside price risk. You do not manage the downside opportunity. That's another discussion that you can engage in. You can tell them, look, the upside price risk is four or five times greater than the downside. You might get another 10, 15, 20 cents, a million BTU. You might get another couple of mills, right? But the, the, the downside pricing action is largely in the bag now. But the upside price risk, as we saw from last year, when it went up 70%, the upside price risk is real. It's multiples of what the downside opportunity is. That's a great discussion to have with customers, isn't it? We're at all-time lows. We're at 30, 50-year lows adjusted for inflation. The downside, Wall Street's getting tough. Things are changing. We're exporting an enormous amount of energy. Our market is changing forever. The downside opportunity is limited. The upside price risk is much higher than the downside opportunity. Now is the time to be buying. I want to buy, buy energy when no one else wants it. And right now, no one else wants it. I don't want to buy it when everybody wants it. I don't want to buy it in November or December when everybody wants it. I want to buy it when nobody wants it. And that's right now. There. And everything I said, by the way, <laughs> everything I said, by the way, is, I disclaim. There so, so I think that's uh, 50 minutes, right? And we have, maybe take a few qu there questions. Are there any questions? Does anyone have any questions? When the next nation's recession happens, will natural gas prices remain the same or fall below $2 per million BTU? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be coy, but I, uh, they're not going to, uh, given the price of money, the discount rate, and given the amount of capital required to produce a million BTU out of a shale well, uh, uh, would prices collapse to a dollar? I very seriously doubt that. If they did, it would be very short-lived. So... I think if we have a mild recession, that uh, energy prices will, will uh, be soft. But again, the downside opportunity is getting fairly limited. Doesn't mean it can't go lower, doesn't mean it can't be softer, but the downside opportunity is limited. So now I have, uh, let's see, 
Uh, 2020 calendar year is that what I'm yeah so question from William so for the 2020 calendar year um, so basically he's asking given all the uncertainties regarding NITS capacity performance uh, tech charges RPS all the change in law events is that going to be more impactful more of a concern for a customer if they want to lock in a, a long-term rate versus if gas prices were to go up to three dollars and fifty they should be concerned about both Mm -hmm. So one is controllable and one isn't. So you got to focus on the controllable. And I think that's how I would talk to, to a customer. You have controls and you have uh, things that are beyond your control. The ancillaries are not. You can, you can help, you can intervene, you can be active. But for the most part, most end users are not going to do that. They're takers of those things that happen. Whereas... On the other side, you can control it. So I'd, I'd focus on what I can control. And if you do have any questions, be, be sure to type those in the Q&A portion of your, uh, your webinar. What's your take on the, the political risk, the outlook? We're getting into the Democratic debates. We've got a year before the election, but of course we're looking at long term. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do to get a Democratic uh, administration in, how is that going to affect the shale revolution and fracking and all that? Or is that mostly going to be done at the state side and the federal is more on offshore? Well, I, that's a great question because I think the political risk is rising a lot relative to the shale revolution. And when you look at the platform of, of the, uh, the Democrats who are running, they're essentially hostile to it. I mean, so there's no other way to put that in terms of uh, whether it's right or wrong or that, that's, not, that's not the issue they're not really friendly to the industry in terms of producing oil and gas. So I don't think that's a, a secret. So, so I think that there is some political risk that's, that's rising there. As to how to quantify that or what to do about it, I think that's a different issue, but certainly there's political risk is rising. Can the, can, if, if uh, someone who's hostile to shell, shale, were to gain the White House, what would the practical implications be of that? Uh, it's a very powerful force, like very low power and gas prices are a very powerful force that almost anyone in the political class, they can say something, but are they really going to dismantle it? Um, we'll, we'll see, but I, I think it would be hard to, or fair to say that the political risk is certainly rising. All right, so question from Stephen. Uh, so Bloom Energy forecasted yesterday that uh, there's potential weakness to their natural gas and electric product due to California and New York rule makers. Is this a trend among states or not to worry? Okay, so Bloom Energy, is this the, is this the, um, the 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 uh, generator, the on-site generator, Bloom Energy, or is this Bloomberg Energy? I want to be clear about that. Uh, uncertain. I'm guessing Bloom Energy. Bloom. Yeah, the, the Bloom box. The Bloom boxes. Yeah, are you familiar with the Bloom boxes? Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, uh, fancy reciprocating engines that make electricity on-site. Okay. There's a company called Bloom energy and then there's bloomberg which is the so i'm 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 uh, i'm assuming this is i'm going to say this is bloomberg based well, on I, I think he said bloom okay bloom bloom energy bloom box. Gosh, I, i'm not sure how the bloom box uh relates to electric product in california I, I, i'm just not familiar enough with the rulemaking that's being cited to really comment, I'm sorry about that. I just don't know enough about well, it. I, I think it might be. I can add some insight. So, like, sure. There, like, uh, is it Berkeley? Is it Berkeley, California, that uh, is eliminating all natural gas, uh, new natural gas installs, things like that? Okay. So, and that's real. That that happens. So yeah. There, and uh, and New York is kind of following suit with mm -hmm. some other regulatory issues that could shut down some of this new emerging technology. Uh, that, that's so is the question, so, so maybe, maybe, that's what the question is. maybe the question is that is demand going to be fundamentally impacted by shutting down facilities like Berkeley and maybe some that's stuff in New York State? Uh, demand will not be adversely, and it's too, much, too small to, to affect aggregate demand in this country. That can be made up by one 
uh, combined cycle power plant by tenfold in, a, in, a, in an afternoon. So uh, how much is Mexico's natural gas demand importing playing a factor? On the, yeah, it's playing, a, it's playing a big factor. There's been an enormous amount of investment in putting pipe across the border. So there's infrastructure improvements that have been significant over the past five or six years pursuant to shale to get gas to Mexico. Mexico is using this gas predominantly to make electricity, obviously, with gas-fired combined cycle technology. Uh, they, they are a, a quickly growing market for us. In 2010, we exported one BCF a day of gas to Mexico. Now we can export seven BCF a day. I think we're currently at five. We hit 6.1 in the first quarter, but we could we could send seven a day over right now. And so Mexico is a very quickly growing um, destination for U.S. natural gas. Additionally, Mexico has very little interest in producing a lot of natural gas on their own. They really have an interest in producing more crude oil, and they're going to focus their capital on that. So they're a great market for us, and it has major implications for Texas and for the, the U.S. market in general. Speaking of Mexico, where do you see their um, commercial um, power um, demand as far as their own generation? Are they? Do you see them generating their own um, electricity? Well, they do generate their own electricity for the most part. They import some, but uh, Mexico generates a lot of its own electric power. In terms of Mexico reforming its power system to accommodate for third-party delivery. I know that there's a lot of buzz around that. There's a lot of interest in it. I know that a couple of parties are actually doing a few one-off deals. I will suggest to you that the market development there is going to be very slow. Follow-up question to that. How do you think Canada is going to, is, is um, Alberta and other um, um, new markets um, up in uh, that area? Uh, Alberta, Canada, do you find that uh, there will be a lot of third-party suppliers working up, uh, more than... Are you talking about electric power markets? Yes. Okay, so the question was electric power markets in Western Canada, are they going to allow for a lot of opportunity for third parties? I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm, not a, I'm not that close to that. So I, I don't really want to comment on it. <laughs> Yeah, so it's interesting though. So I, either Alberta or Ontario, I can't remember which one, they completely phased out coal powered generations. And then uh, the other one is, is working towards that same goal. So see that correlation to the natural gas flowing over the, the northern border and having them import more from us. So definitely something that uh, I, I know they have a stronger reliance on hydropower up there, but as they increase their natural gas infrastructure, they're, they're certainly going to be demanding more gas from us, I would assume. And they're producing less. So their production has been falling off significantly in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. That was their prolific production. But that's been falling off for, for years and years. While our production has been exploding to the upside, theirs has been falling. And that's the predominant reason why they're importing gas from us on a net basis. All right, so let's take one last question here. Uh, so this this is something that we get quite often um, in most of the webinars that we've done. Uh, so what markets are most likely to open next? Florida for electricity, any others that might be on the verge? If, if you were to have to take a guess based on what, what we're seeing out there in the market, this is, you can almost flip a coin with this. Arizona and Florida, I think, are, are, are potential potential markets that will open up. Uh, Florida would obviously be a much bigger market. Florida has a population of 22 and a half million people. Arizona has a population of 6 million people. So it's a, you know, four or five times bigger market. So uh, from a, from a market perspective, if you're a seller, you know, you want, you want it to be Florida, right? <laughs> Cause that would offer enough to, uh, a pie to go around. There's one, there is one market that's technically open, but we haven't seen much uh, business there. It's the Virginia market, so Jamaica yeah. and Virginia. So now there, there are real difficult rules. You basically have to be a very large customer, five megawatts or larger. 
Um, we've opened up. We're we're in that marketplace. Single site. Uh, for the most part, single site you can aggregate, but you can't do a great a great example is Costco and Walmart both wanted to aggregate all of their stores and shipping facilities and. Um, went to the PUC and asked for uh, uh, for that permission to do that. They both got next. Um, so you can you can aggregate. So let's just say a school like a William and Mary that has you know a bunch of dorms and so on and so forth over five megawatts. You know that that can happen. So just as long as you don't aggregate too much. Yes. Yeah, so, well, that's really well. They, you know, Dominion made the argument that it's taking too much of the load off yeah. of, off of their system, which is just, you know. Looking at Brian's face, to me, I say the same thing. It's kind of that's kind of a hokey, hokey thing. But yeah. uh, um, but that that is a market that's very viable. There actually is a, a small gap of savings for, for customers willing to do that. Two things two, two things to worry about again is size. You know, five megawatts or larger, and the customer if they decide to to uh, move off to a third party supplier, they cannot go back to Dominion for five years. And and you know for them to do that, they'd also have to give that like immediate notice when they did their deal. So so it's a five years a five year uh, non putback situation. So there's a lot of strings attached. Yeah, <laughs> but, but that market in terms of in terms of the real viability of open markets uh, yeah. really happening, that is the biggest opportunity you have in the marketplace right now. So. Awesome. All right. Well, let's let's wrap it up. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this this uh, webinar will be posted to your uh, the newsfeed of your portal soon. We will also send out an email uh, with the webinar link. Uh, so, for all those uh, that you know that were unable to join us live today, it will be available by uh, hopefully by by this Friday. We'll we'll try to get up as soon as possible. So. I uh, want to thank our guests, uh, Brian Havasevich uh, and the Constellation team for, for coming in and, and giving us this information. If you have any follow-up questions, please let us know. There's, there's a tremendous amount of information that you can use here to impact your sales. Start conversations with, with your clients. So please use it. Um, and, and like I said, if you have any more questions, let us know. We'll, we'll answer as best we can. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon.